uh, will be joined as we, yes, as we go on, we'll be joined by the rest of the team. So without further ado, um, welcome to this webinar uh, in a series on open science for the discoverability of African research. My name is Harold Boa. I am the Business Development Officer at UbuntuNet Alliance, and I'll be your moderator today. Uh, I'm just stepping in. The webinar is presented to you by UbuntuNet Alliance, uh, Access to Perspectives, and it's supported by ORCID. So before I introduce our presenters today, allow me to just say a little uh, brief introduction on Ubuntu Alliance and uh, Access and, and Africa Archive, rather. So Ubuntu Alliance uh, is the regional research and education network for Eastern and Southern Africa. We exist as a member organization. These members are National Research and Education Networks, uh, NRINs. Uh, these are in-country organizations whose main prerogative is to provide research and education resources at the national level. And uh, due to this nature, the activities are usually, they usually exist as uh, government entities. Ubuntu Alliance therefore exists as a collaboration amongst NRINs from different countries in Eastern and Southern Africa. Uh, in order to facilitate collaboration amongst themselves. Uh, through Ubuntu Alliance, entrants are able to acquire various resources, which they then provide to their members in their countries, uh, primarily institutions of higher learning, such as universities and colleges. The main resource uh, that is provided is internet connectivity, which provides the foundation for providing more digital resources, such as cybersecurity and other packaged uh, services such as Eduroam, uh, Educain, and Identity Federation, such as those. Through the Africa Connect project, uh, which is co-funded by the EU, Ubuntu Net Alliance has managed to build the Ubuntu Net Alliance regional internet backbone, uh, to which we have connected 13 member NRINs, uh, National Research and Education Networks, out of the 16 NRINs, uh, which are our members, uh, which is... Uh, uh, 16 out of the 26 countries in the entire region. So it's it's progress. Uh, a little about Africa Archive. Africa Archive is a community-led digital archive for African research communication. By enhancing the visibility of African research, Africa Archive enables discoverability and collaboration opportunities for African scientists on the continent as well as globally. Over the past five years, Africa Archive has partnered with the generalist repository systems, Zenodo, Figshare, Science Open, PubPub, and the Open Science Framework. However, this year, in 2023, that is, uh, we are integrating Africa Archive as a service unit and central repository at Ubuntu Net Alliance. Uh, this serves several stakeholders, uh, Maybe you might find yourself in some of the stakeholders which this activity is serving. Uh, for example, researchers. Uh, the repository uh, is repre will represent a central Africa Archive will represent a central repository that houses articles and publications from repositories across the continent of Africa, making it easier for you as a researcher to find needed research reference work. Equally, on the flip side, uh, as a researcher who uh, wants to publish your work. Uh, it uh, allows you to make your work more discoverable. Uh, the archive will have multiple repositories, including a general repository that allows you as a researcher to submit your work. For any institution that is currently holding a digital repository, for example, universities and colleges, we can create a repository within the archive specific for that university or college or institution. Uh, and uh, we, we can set it up uh, such that it makes their research output easier to find but also their researchers who create the output itself easier to discover and cite. And the more citations they get as a university, the higher they are ranking, which serves them very, very well. The archive will incorporate the use of persistent identifiers uh, to ensure that the content that is available on it uh, remains discoverable. What we want from you as a community is to deposit your research work into the general repository as of now. And uh, you can do this by using the URL, which I'll share in the chat, I'll share in the chat shortly um, to deposit your scholarly work 
uh, with us moving forward as we continue to collaborate with our partners. For today's webinar session, we welcome two speakers, Stephanie Dawson and Andrew Joseph. Allow me to introduce them. Stephanie Dawson grew up in Northern California and studied biology at Yale University. She then worked at the labs of Susan Parkhurst at the Field Hutchinson Cancer Research Center in Seattle, Washington, and Ralph Roop at the MPG Frederick Mischer Laboratory. Uh, Germany, uh, sorry, Germany, Sorry, sorry, sorry. Let me say that again. She then worked at the labs of Susan Parkhurst at the Field Hutchison Cancer Research Center in Seattle, Washington, and Ralph Rupp at the MPG Frederick Mischer Laboratory, Tübingen, Germany, before changing fields to getting a PhD in German literature from the University of Washington under Jane Brown. From 2001 to 2012, she worked in various positions at the academic publisher De Gruyter in Berlin in the fields of biology and chemistry in both journals and book publishing. In 2013, she took on the role of Managing Director of Science Open, GmbH, in Berlin. Andrew Joseph. Uh, Andrew Joseph is the digital publisher of at Wits University Press, and his publishing experience has largely been in academic and reference publications. Andrew has worked, has worked with most major European and US academic publishers, including Springer, Nature, uh, Macmillan, Elsevier, Taylor and Francis, Wiley, and Sage. He is closely involved with standards development and implementation, especially for metadata, persistent identifiers, uh, such as ORCID and XML workflows for scholarly publishers, and serves on advisory boards and committees for Crossref, the Open Access Data Trust Exchange, coalitions, and the Onyx International Steering Committee. Andrew currently serves as chair of the Scholarly Publishers Committee for the Publishers Association of South Africa and chairs the South Africa and chairs the South African National Metadata Users Group, a cross-industry metadata standards group. Wits University Press works with Science Open to increase the reach and discoverability of their publications. And now, over to you, uh, Stephanie. Thanks. Uh, thanks so much for inviting me to be here. I'm just going to share my screen. Um, and uh, I'm also really excited to uh, share share the stage here with Andrew, um, who I am very, very excited to start working with on a new um, project this year. So um, Science Open, uh, I want to talk today about open discovery and publishing in an African context. Uh, we have been working with Africa Archive for quite some time. Um, uh, I have uh, known Joe uh, Haverman for a while, so it's um, really exciting to be here. Um, so what is, what is Science Open? Um, we are at our core, we are a discovery environment. We have around 90 million records for research articles, books, conference proceedings, chapters, data sets, um, et cetera. <clears throat> and how we've built the database, we aggregate content on a daily basis from a few big open access sources. So from Cielo, Archive, the PubMed Central open access data subset, and then directly from our publisher customers. Whenever a new article comes into the database, we analyze the um, references. We do a lookup uh, in our own database. If we've seen that before, we increase the citation index. If not, we go to Crossref or Datacite or PubMed and get the publicly available metadata and create a new record and so on and so on. So in this way, we can really iteratively grow the database in those fields that are most um, relevant to our partners and customers and users. Um, on top of that discovery um, database, we have an interactive overlay so that researchers can um, interact with the content, can recommend, review, share, write a lay summary, create a best of list 
um, to communicate with their um, uh, peers. And then our business model is based on providing services to publishers and institutes and societies embedded in that discovery environment. So we provide everything from promotion and author marketing tools that link back to the publisher's website. We can um, provide support with best practices and metadata. We have open access hosting services or full publishing solutions, and we can work with journals, books, and conference um, proceedings. We have, um, as I said, been um, uh, very lucky to be working with Africa Archive um, preprints <clears throat> for quite some time. We make sort of a nice, um, we provide a nice help because we both can accept new um, submissions and as well we can work with um, other content that is coming, um, uh, that's being coming from other preprint um, platforms such as Figshare and um, <clears throat> Center of Open Science uh, and Zenodo, et cetera. Um, we work with a bunch of um, uh, different groups in um, Africa on the continent or so from the north to the south. So we work with the King Center, uh, King Solomon Center for Disability Research and Emirates Scholar in um, uh, the MENA region. We um, have, uh, we host the journal, the Nigerian Journal of Tropical Engineering and the African Journal of Empirical Research in Sudan. Uh, for the Sudanese Researcher Foundation, we helped them to found the African Journal of Engineering and Technology. In South Africa, we work also with the University of South Africa Press on a preprint repository, um, UNISA Archive, and as well some other um, journal projects. We aggregate all of the all of the content from um, Cielo, but it's in nice packages, so you can also explore the Cielo South Africa content. So there's a lot of open access content um, uh, from Africa that we are adding to the platform every day. On the book side. We um, work with the open access um, publisher African Minds and host their book content on the platform. We also um, promote, have a promotional collection for the South African Journal of Science from the um, Academy of Sciences. And we're really excited to be hosting and um, providing publishing infrastructure for the WITS Journal of Clinical Medicine. Um, and uh, this is a project where I would love to um, invite Andrew to say a few words about this um, this new journal that uh, they are publishing at the Wits University Press. Stephanie, I hope everyone can hear me. My headphones just came out at the last minute, but thanks so much for inviting us to to attend here and um yeah as stephanie said we've been we've partnered up with science open since um around about the middle of this year june and july uh, and we've published two issues now with science open which has gone uh incredibly well the journal has been running for the past five years um at its heart uh, we have always set out for this to be an open access journal, uh, but also to truly uh, begin to pull together clinical medical research uh, in the country. So we have an excellent team of um, editors and editorial and editorial board who are very, very active uh, researchers, uh, particularly active in uh, during the COVID pandemic. Um, South Africa and Wits University particularly was a major center of activity around the vaccine development uh, and treatment strategies. Uh, and we were very, very pleased to be part of that. Um, moving into things like climate health, uh, which is becoming more of an issue. So editorially, the focus uh, is there and the, the quality of the research is great. But as Stephanie is going to say, it, it needs um, more of the discoverability uh, and some of the technological publishing aspects in order to make sure that that's discovered. And we're really finding that uh, working exceptionally well for us through Science Hope. Thanks, Stephanie. Cool, thanks. Um, so I'm gonna, uh, as I go through some of the features of the platform, um, there's a, uh, I may um, every once in a while ask uh, uh, Andrew for support as well for um, uh, some uh, of the 
things that we wanted to talk today. So um, the first, as you can imagine, as you can imagine, we are a discovery platform. So the thing that we really care about is um, discoverability and and how can you highlight content within this huge amount of um, data that we have. But I would also say that I am focusing on the topic of metadata really from the perspective of a content aggregator and discovery platform. So um, there's other kinds of discovery platforms out there like library systems, et cetera, that are working with different kinds of um, metadata. So I do have my sort of um, specific slant on this. But um, the first place that I would start, would really wanna start um, because I assume some of you are potentially editors, publishers, um, or even authors, is really just the basic unit of discoverability um, uh, from my perspective as an aggregator is the digital object identifier or DOI. And just as a reminder, a DOI is a stable identifier that links to the article or book homepage uh, or URL. And URLs tend to change over time. This was really why the DOI system was created um, because there was so much um, link rot um, uh, people found. Um, publishers update their website, change platforms, journals are bought, sold, move. So when um, with a DOI, the publisher just needs to let the DOI service know that there's a new URL and all links will continue to work and will always then continue to take you to the article that you're looking for. And the institutions managing DOIs for academic publishing are Crossref and um, Datacite. Um, so when publishers uh, deposit a DOI and corresponding URL, they also add some information about the article that can help identify. And this metadata um, about the article includes the journal title, volume, issue, publication date, the article title and authors, um, affiliations, um, and uh, much more. Uh, and this metadata can be made publicly available so that services like Science Open can then query the DOI to access the extended information about it and link to the version of record on the publisher's website. So for both publishers and authors, this metadata, you can think about it as the business card for your article. Um, and uh, if you, so you can imagine what kind of a business card would you like to have? Would you like to have one that has all of your contact information and everything uh, 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 that would encourage somebody to get in touch? Or do you just want to have your name on it? So this is really um, uh, one way to think about this metadata. And you can see here the some of the different kinds of um, uh, metadata um, fields and how this metadata is stored is in XML. And so we'll come back to this again and again, the topic of XML, um, but this just, this just means a shared set of tags that all computers that we've all agreed on, that all computers can um, uh, use um, to uh, basically um, improve the exchangeability of information. So you can see here, this is the abstract for this um, metadata set. It starts with the tag abstract, ends with the tag abstract, and it helps the um, computer to understand what this piece of text actually is. Um, and uh, so abstracts, um, let's say, are, the ex are, are one of the really important pieces of extended metadata that you can include. And you can imagine if you're an aggregation platform and you're doing searches, more words means more chances for your content to get found. Um, and this is what we've found um, on our platform, having abstracts as part of your metadata and whether that's books, um, journal articles, chapters, um, increases the discoverability of your content just because it's more words. And it also increases the amount of time that people actually interact with the content. So um, we found that um, articles with no abstracts accounted for 30% of the content, but for less than 7% of the views. Um, and the top um, articles with abstracts had 25 times more views than the top articles 
without abstracts. Um, and uh, as well, you can see the top article without an abstract had 153 views as opposed to the um, top article with an abstract that had 1400 views. Um, the, uh, the same, uh, the same thing for, oh, I think I have the same slide twice. Um, so we have um, other collections where we have the, a similar um, situation. Um, so uh, one place to just um, check the, what level of, like how good is your business card? What level of metadata are you attaching to your DOI? Um, uh, one place you can check that is on the Crossref participation report. So for all publishers that are a member of Crossref and are using Crossref DOIs, you can just go to the crossref.org slash members slash prep, and you can see the percentage of your content that um, actually is um, providing DOIs, uh, uh, providing extended metadata for their, for their DOIs. Um, and I would also encourage, even if you're if you're an author, um, and you're trying to ask yourself, uh, should I publish in a certain journal? Um, uh, maybe you've all um, uh, looked at the think um, uh, think check submit uh, that you really first look look at the whole um, context of that journal that you might want to submit to. I would also really think about what kind of what kind of digital um, uh, metadata are they providing to all of the other services out there? So this is definitely something, if it's a smaller journal, you might want to check and make sure, are they handing out DOIs? What is the level of, um, of complexity of those DOIs? Um, so uh, that's something that I would uh, definitely keep, in, keep, in, keep an eye on. Um, the most, uh, but one of the most challenging and rewarding, let's say, metadata set um, is the reference list. Um, and I call this a metadata set. Let's say that was something the whole industry or the whole, let's, it was mostly the open access community, fought hard for to have the publishing um, industry agree that the reference list is metadata and not part of the copyrighted um, uh, uh, part of the um, article, so be able being able to freely share the 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 reference lists um, is uh, as as a metadata set is relatively new, um, and it's important because citations are really the most valuable currency within the academic system. So we already heard um, grants, promotions, and jobs depend on them, and if systems are really um, left up to themselves, like a system like Science Open, to try to compare titles, authors, publication date to make a best guess if a particular article is being cited without an identifier, then a lot of citations can get missed. Um, and since it's one of the most important ways to measure sort of the relevance of the re research that you publish, you certainly um, would want your content to be as well linked into the scientific record as 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 possible. Um, so uh, uh, DOIs in terms of citation tracking um, are uh, extremely important and they can also be really used as a as a discovery tool. So if if I'm doing research, I really often go to the go to the um, the page, uh, the the reference list and see like oh do I know these papers oh this might be a, a another place to continue continue my search and we really try to make that easy um, uh, on science open um, and it's not it's 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 really not easy um, uh, in 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 order for these uh, for references to be um, uh, ingested by search engines. They need some really basic information, and most importantly, um, uh, is the DOI. So, really, only if you add the DOI to your references can you be sure that a correct um, link will be made. And as editors, 
I would recommend that instead of worrying about particular reference styles, semicolon versus comma versus italics or bold, I really would recommend requiring your authors to chase down the DOIs of the articles, books, or chapters that they cite. I would recommend that your copy editors check that those DOIs are correct. Um, and I would definitely make those easily digestible for um, public um, systems because every link to your paper is really potentially um, somebody making it um, easier uh, for someone to for someone to find. I mean, this is how Google works, right? The more links um, to a particular website, the higher it is in the ranking. Um, it makes a lot of sense, um, and you're you you want to have as many links uh, 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 to your paper as possible. But um, uh, you can see what this looks like. It's um, uh, it's it's not um, easier straightforward. Um, uh, Reference tagging is probably one of the most challenging pieces of um, creating XML, but it's also only one part of the whole um, uh, tagging suite that um, you would need to do your entire, um, to, to publish your entire paper with an XML first workflow. And this is one really um, fantastic thing that um, Andrew, is um, doing with the WJCM journal that um, the entire journal is being published in full XML. So there's costs associated with that, but there's also advantages. Um, Andrew, maybe you would say a few words about, yeah, how 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 did you make that decision to to spend that extra time and money? Thanks, Stephanie. Um... Yeah, just to, just to emphasize everything you you, you said, uh, particularly you know the, the, with with considering the metadata as the the, the sort of back the, the the back part of of the content. So you've got the content which is which is created in metadata because it's because it works in an XML format. It allows itself to be plugged into the various sort of discoverability angles. Uh, sources um, that that could be done. Uh, the decision to 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 pursue an XML workflow to so to create XML of our full full XML for for the articles was based largely on my experience um, working in the UK um, and just seeing large publishers doing it and and they're re they were really beginning to reap the benefits of it. Obviously, you know, ten years later, that's that's grown even more. Uh, and I just thought, well, wh why is it only European and American publishers that have access to this? Why don't we have this in Africa? Uh, it's not rocket science. Uh, it's it's coded information. Um, it does need some specialization, some specialized skills, and we use uh, offshore suppliers uh, and service providers to do it. But it's the same service providers, really, who do this for for the for the large um, commercial publishers. Uh, Part of the decision and working around it or the benefits of it are a beautiful precision um, that comes from it. So what what we do when we're able to when we're when we're uploading an article to um, to Science Open is we just simply send the XML through to uh, to Nina Checker at uh, at Science Open, who's, who does a fantastic job, by the way. Uh, that's ingested and and less than twenty four hours later, the the article. Uh, populates itself almost. I know there's a lot of work that goes on there, but but it's a pretty much automated process with some some human checking uh, that goes on. Um, and because everything is so neatly packaged into this is the title, this is the abstract, this is the subtitle, that's the author, corresponding author, etc. It simply falls into place very very easily. And the the limitations of that are obviously one has to fit into the. Um, there's certain paradigms, I guess, uh, that 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 one has to fit into. There's certain limitations to it, but the but the benefits far outweigh uh, outweigh the, um, the 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 downsides of that. Uh, so the, there's the efficiency, there's the accuracy, there's the very quick turnaround, uh, and but but I think underlying all of that is a is a bigger political reason for us, which is that by having it in XML, when there are format changes in the future, which there will be. Uh, our content's assured to be continually available. So 
I'm not predicting the demise of Adobe and PDF, but I suppose in 10 years' time, no one will use PDFs. There will be another sort of thing, uh, as, as has happened, as we've all seen happen. Uh, what XML does, and Stephanie mentioned this very specifically, is that because it's agreed to tagging and agreed to systems of operating on both the publisher end and the system end, and on the platform end, no changes really happen to the XML unless there's really consensus amongst amongst those sides. So everyone involved in the research ecosystem and the discoverability protocols uh, and publishers uh, participate in saying, well, we'll change this element to that. We won't call it a title anymore. We'll call it a header, something like that. Whatever those changes are, they're all agreed to. So the future proofing of your content is really, really assured um, in that. Thanks, Stephanie. Yeah, I mean, I would also just mention, especially in the um, in the medical fields, like this uh, Journal of Clinical Medicine, as well. Um, PubMed is a is a big topic. Um, if you're publishing an open access journal in the medical field, you really would like to get indexed in the PubMed database, in the PubMed Central database, and they require full text, full XML. Um, so, if you're anyway in that, if you're in that field in any way, and this is a goal, then it's worth just like going for it, kicking off, starting everything with the uh, with XML from the very beginning, because you'll have to go back otherwise and do it all anyway. <laughs> so, um, and the, the the other thing that XML really lets, lets us do, as you can imagine, is compare content from lots of different publishers. So we have 90 million articles um, uh, within our discovery environment. And the first thing that people want to do is say, oh, um, show me all the ones that are open access, or um, I would just only like to see mini reviews. Um, and you can imagine there's a there's a general um, uh, vocabulary for open access licenses. So we can really easily say, show me things that have an open access Creative Commons license. But um, mini review is something really difficult because one publisher calls it um, short communication, the other calls it mini review, the other person calls it this and that. There's lots of different kinds of ways to describe this that aren't, you know, unified and shared with a shared vocabulary. So we can't offer this because you it wouldn't really deliver good enough results that, um, that it would make it worth your while to have um, that kind of a filter. So that's the kind of shared vocabulary that that I think we all want to work towards because being able to compare um, in different um, in different search databases is how you increase your discoverability. Um, and so I would just uh, use that to segue into the next piece of um, uh, the next persistent identifier that I think is 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 really important, and that's the um, um, ORCID ID. Uh, if you don't have one, do it today take you only a few minutes. Uh, more and more publishers require this author identifier at the point of manuscript submission. So you probably already have one. And with your ORCID, you can verify that you're the author. So I myself, um, as you heard from my, uh, from my history, I've published a paper on Drosophila genetics and I have a published paper about Goethe's Faust. Um, and no artificial intelligence in the world is going to guess that those are the same Stephanie Dawson's, right? Um, so to make sure that your articles are not assigned to some different author in a database like ours, um, this is where um, ORCID can um, step in. And ORCID has also an, an added advantage for, for, for authors in that um, you are increasingly you can increasingly use ORCID as, as a, an, an, an author profile. So ORCID, um, since, it's, since it's beginning, it was you know, your identifier and a publication list. Now you can add grants, you can add um, employment history, education, keywords. You can add a lot of information to your ORCID profile. And on Science Open, we don't really 
um, have an author profile per se on Science Open, we just link to your ORCID profile. So if you've got keywords on your ORCID profile, we'll add those to Science Open. If not, so there's no keywords. If you have an app, uh, if you have a short um, description, if you've got your whole publication list or only one publication or zero publications, whatever, that's what we show on Science Open. So what we don't, if you, if you, add papers to your science open profile, we'll add those to ORCID. So we really strongly believe don't just make it look beautiful on our platform, make it look beautiful at those pieces of the scholarly infrastructure that are being used not only by science open, but by all of the other members out there. And I think that's one thing that I care about very much is to say, you know, we you can come on to science open and, you know, see how your metadata looks in the wild. You can see what your ORCID profile looks like. You can see what, um, how our computers reading out your your content, um, and uh, and and I would always recommend people, you know, go back and uh, make it look um, beautiful at the source if you have that opportunity. Beyond just the persistent identifiers for authors, so really this your one, you know, code for your author list. There's a lot of other persistent identifiers out there. Um, one of them is the, um, the, the ROAR IDs to identify research organizations um, and how this you can imagine might be used is if you want to search an affiliation, um, uh, uh, you can either use a full, just a text search, a text string, or if you've got really a code, you can be 100% sure that you're not mixing up um, different uh, 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 entities. So um, we were working with the University College London UCL, but um, there's also another uh, there's also another um, college I think in France with the same UCL, right? And those data sets get consistently mixed. So using um, ROAR IDs can help prevent that. And on Science Open. Um, what we and, and there's a there's a quite a long list of other persistent identifiers that I that I could go into, but um, for the for the sake of of brevity, I would say we we also do include fundref um, IDs on Science Open. Um, there's other ones like the Credit Taxonomy RAID um, and 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 many more. We sometimes watch and see which ones are you know getting picked up more um, uh, in the community. Um, and then what we try to do with our customers on Science Open is, is really to provide an intuitive, easy um, interface as well to manage that metadata, both for books and for journals. Um, this is an example from the African Minds publisher um, where they're actually hosting their content on Science Open. So if they notice uh, a typo in the abstract or um, uh, they um, um, merged two keywords or something like this happened, um, they can just click on this enhanced metadata or they for didn't add ROAR IDs at that point. They can click on this enhanced metadata um, uh, field. It opens up a, an intuitive space where they can hear, add the affiliation is missing, the ROAR ID is missing. So you can imagine it would be quite, um, quite, Unfortunate, this um, if somebody was looking for authors in Africa, this author work wouldn't show up if I'm searching in the affiliation field. Um, so um, they can just go in and add this information and we add it not just to the record on Science Open, but we update that at Crossref for them. So that the next person who queries their DOI gets a richer metadata set. Um, and uh, we also have that in place as well for the um, uh, uh, for the W uh, JCM journal. So for every article, if there's just a tiny thing, if it's a big thing, if it's a big thing, you might want to you know re-upload the whole package. But if it's a, just a tiny um, error, you can fix that on the website, and we'll fix that also at all of the other places for Google Scholar for the um, uh, for every database. We'll just resend them your updated records. Um, one thing that we have done, because um, books, I think, are um, something that are consistently um, uh, not taken um, 
books have really a different set of metadata sort of historically that has been aimed at booksellers, has been aimed at um, uh, librarians. Um, so book metadata has sort of grown in a different direction than article level meta metadata that is usually the starting point for aggregation platforms. Um, so we strongly encourage every publisher to get DOIs for their books, um, because if you have a DOI for your book, we it can be cited, it can be shared. We'll always link back to the publisher version of record on your website. We've got a buy book button that will send people to your web shop. So there's lots of um, great reasons to have um, uh, a DOI for your book. But we also learned that it's not so easy. Plus you also have your own um, metadata set. Uh, uh, Andrew mentioned Onyx. So you've got your Onyx metadata set, but you need to um, maybe enrich your Crossref metadata or create a Crossref metadata. We can do that for you at Science Open as a service, but we also have a free book meta hub interface where you can create your own Crossref ready um, XML metadata. So just like flag that up here, it's free. If you're thinking about, you've got a small number of books and you'd wanna do it yourself um, uh, process, um, you can check this out and also just get in touch. Um, so I've talked a lot, I'm just gonna quickly wrap up, but with just a few things about um, uh, author communication, because I've been talking a lot about the structural things that you can do for um, uh, to increase your discoverability. I would like to just one thing touch on because I imagine we've got some authors, we've got some researchers um, uh, online um, listening. What can you do to increase the visibility of your work? And that really is often up to you tapping into your um, network. I mean, publishers can only go so far. Um, the first really most basic thing that you can do as an author is to really share your newly published article with your peers. And traditionally, researchers did that at conferences or they got print um, uh, uh, copies of their articles that they handed out to people. Um, now, everything is digital. Most researchers are using Twitter, Facebook, ResearchGate, um, and other places to get the news out about a new publication. And it can just be as simple as saying, here, um, I have a new um, article. And we do have just a one-click share button um, on Science Open uh, to um, make that um, to make that as easy as possible. So you can share to Twitter. If you're in China, you can share to the Sina Weibo network. Um, we've also got a Facebook and email. You can use any of those, or um, you can just copy the link into whatever platform that you're using. We have a few easy ways that you can also um, uh, support good papers and your colleagues with the one-click recommendation button that makes things really easy. Um, you can write comments um, or even review. And all of the online um, activity that's tracked around your publication feeds into your altmetric score. So altmetric um, uh, is um, uh, a company that we um, uh, are working with. Uh, the DOI is required for an altmetric score. So um, therefore, Witsa University Press, as we heard, are working really hard to make sure that every publication is assigned a Crossref DOI. And in those articles and beyond and your work, you can sort by the altmetric score to get a sense of how your work stacks up compared to, in terms of online mentions, compared to other papers in a really similar, in a, in a similar field. If you click on this little altmetric score, it opens the um, altmetric uh, donut that shows you how that content has been used. So this um, paper has been mentioned in the news, it's been mentioned on blog posts, um, and you can drill down and look at any of those um, uh, places where it's been, where it's been viewed. Um, and just a last um, things on Science Open, we have the possibility to create researcher-led collections. So, these are free for researchers to create. You can use them as community resources for teaching or for outreach, or wherever there's an overlap with another collection on the platform. It's visible at the top left hand of the menu. Um, and any researchers who are interested in creating um, any collections, let me know. We would love to see more Africa-specific um, 
uh, researcher-led collections on the on the platform. And um, the last thing that I would mention is the article reviews on the platform. So on Science Open, it's possible to review an article very much like a book review. So we have a built-in engine to invite um, uh, to in, in invite reviewers or to review it yourself. Um, we have a built-in peer review questionnaire, ORCID integration for reviewers. So you have to have an, um, an ORCID to review, but we also give each review a Crossref DOI and we show, we, we, we created a peer review DOI that's related to the article. So it says peer review of this article. Um, and we have uh, some other, um, the comment function you can also use to respond to the um, the comments if you're the author or if you're another user. So there's a nice um, and there can be a nice discussion going on. Um, and with preprints, it's even more I think um, important because with preprints you've got um, maybe articles that are still in process. They haven't been they haven't been um, reviewed yet. So some of the um, work on Africa Archive, those researchers are really out there looking for feedback. They would love to hear from you. Like, is there something that they could improve? Um, would you like to connect? Are there, um, uh, 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 do you have other ideas? So I would highly recommend you to explore the Africa Archive. And, you know, one way you can really support um, other researchers is by, um, giving them some feedback on their work. So with that, I would like to end my um, presentation. Um, and I would also like to, um, uh, I've been talking quite a bit. I would really like to also turn over to, uh, turn over to Andrew for a few um, closing words if there's something that I missed. And otherwise, I think we're then open for discussion. Um, apologies. Sorry, I had a little trouble with my internet. Apologies <laughs> about that. No, I, I, I just finished up and I said, uh, um, I would like to uh, uh, hand over to you for any um, things that I missed, any things that... Uh, that we should um, make sure that we mention. Well, thanks, thanks so much, Stephanie. Uh, and just, just a, I think a, a, a few things for me was just uh, the importance of um, of the metadata kind of extends to uh, the books as well. Uh, so, Wits University Press is a is a is, is largely a book publisher with a with a small journal journal list. The technologies and the and the kind of capabilities across both books and journals. So, metadata, the use of XML, the use of identifiers, persistent identifiers, DOIs, and and orchids. What what we're doing is affording all of the content the same reach. Um, so all of those kind of discoverabilities and uh, the use of alt metrics, the tweets, and the Facebooks, and all of that kind of stuff. But more importantly, the the research. Um, measurement of research activity through citations and through um, through reference accessing applies for both books and journals uh, for us. So by using uh, things like Onyx, which is standardized book metadata, we're able to feed the information into the research ecosystem, but we're also able to then put it into the book supply chain um, as well. So, so I think by by trying to perhaps what I'm suggesting for more for publishers really uh, for publishers who who have both books and and journals is to is to try to integrate these two things. I see I see a closing gap personally between books and journal and the, and the way in which people access content and the way in which people are searching for things so if you make it as easy as possible by having all of that underlying infrastructure the the, the pipes and the wiring uh, that allows them to find it through through a number of sources so that's uh, perhaps just something i think that that people should should keep in mind there's also uh, subject switches, I think, that happen here. So we publish a medical journal, but most of the books that we publish are um, arts and humanities and social sciences. We do go into uh, some, some technical subjects as well. 
but um, you're going to find different needs for uh, for for discoverability if you're doing medicine and if you're doing law and if you're doing history. These referencing systems are different. The way people find it, the way they come into it is going to be completely different. So I think you have to have a, a sense of awareness of that. Uh, and what we try to do is uh, is, is is as as have as vanilla an approach as possible uh, to cover as many of the basic boundaries, uh, as many of the basic needs as, as as are required, and then enhance. So Stephanie mentioned the enhanced metadata feature. Uh, that may not be appropriate for us to be selling a book through, um, so selling a book through Amazon, but uh, it may be necessary for for a search capability on 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 Science Open, for instance. So there's all sorts of enhancement I think that 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 can be done after the fact. Uh, we're doing that at the moment with with Stephanie. We're doing a um, uh, to assign DOIs to our individual book chapters uh, in order to make each chapter discoverable. So that I think you know if you get the basic stuff done and it lines up uh, with the research ecosystem. You can always add on top of this and always build build up. There, there are always going to be changes and, and adjustments uh, that, that that need to be made. Uh, I think that might be, I think that might be it. Thank you. Thanks, Stephanie. Thank oh. you, thank you so much. Um, yeah, thank you so much, Stephanie and Andrew, for such a comprehensive presentation. Uh, very, very engaging. Before I open it up to questions from. Uh, the participants and the attendees, perhaps maybe just to get some more clarification from you, Stephanie, which are the African journals and publishers currently indexed in Science Open and using the platform? Well, we have a, um, uh, I, I ran through the, I ran through the list in my, um, in my, uh, in my talk. In, in South Africa, we are working, um, uh, beyond working with VITS, we're also working with the UNISA um, Press uh, and the African Minds um, a publisher, open access publisher um, located in Cape Town. So uh, we have a, a certain number of um, uh, partners already, also institutional partners in um, in South Africa, um, sort of in 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 the middle. Uh, uh, of the continent, we have a few um, uh, individual journals that um, that we are hosting and also providing some publishing services um, for like the Nigerian Journal of Tropical Engineering, um, the uh, uh, and the Sudanese Researchers um, Foundation Journal. So um, I think we have uh, we have um, I think an offering that is 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 reach is meeting people's needs in 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 on the african continent but we would step we would definitely like to um uh work with more uh individual journals or um whole um university presses mm -hmm. also also whilst on uh, the african continent what are some common challenges that uh, experience that are experienced by the african continent itself that Science Open can help circumvent and remove with the platform that you're providing to publishers. I think discoverability is a huge, um, is 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 really a huge issue on the on the African continent. I mean, I think um, what the Ubuntu Net is um, working on. I mean, the first step is of course um, better um, digital access because. Uh, the everything that we're talking about today is really everything is in a digital form. So, um, which is, you know, great if you've got good broadband width and things like that. So I think the first thing that people, that we sometimes have to keep in mind, we're so used to everything being all the time uh, digitally um, uh, accessible, but that's certainly the first step um, and not something that we can help with. But otherwise we, um, I mean, we are, a freely accessible platform that uh, does um, so we don't charge anything for researchers. Everybody can use our discovery tools. We don't even you don't have, even have to register. Um, but if you do register, we do have requirements like having an ORCID. So we really are trying to nudge people towards better um, 
open science uh, practices. And with that, I think what we, I think this discoverability challenge is 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 tied to that open science um, practices. Using DOIs, using persistent identifiers will really help that content to get better, um, uh, to get digested better into the into the more global um, scientific record. I think that's something that that South America has done an amazing job at with the Cielo project. There's a really big, there's such a big data set at, at this point that you know suddenly people are like, oh well, you know, even big um, uh, and exclusive products like Web of Science are like, oh well, hmm, look at all of that um, data all in a in a um, uniform um, format tagged in XML, you know, it's uh, uh, it's just too tempting to to um, uh, tap into all of that uh, all of that data and start adding that to your um, adding that to your uh, database. But if you're if you have to work with tiny individual journals um, who are doing everything on their own and putting um, you know uh, putting PDFs up on a website. That's going to be much, much more difficult to um, integrate. So I think that's really the. Um, I think one of the big challenges is to get mm. things into it into a digestible form for the for aggregators. Mm, mm, mm. Thank you, thank you so much for for that insight. And uh, Andrew, uh, how do you find partnering with services such as Science Open makes your work uh, at Wits University Press easier? Thank you. Thanks, Harold. Um, I, I, I just wondered if I could come in on the last question that you asked to Stephanie. <laughs> no, you didn't ask me oh, that. But, um, but 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 just some of the some of the challenges I think that 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 we face as African publishers um, is firstly for me, I, I sort of um, Stephanie was hinting at this, but but something about a, a lack of coordinated action. Uh, and I think I think there's there, there's something to be done, and and perhaps you know Joe Joe we've all spoken about this, we've all discussed it in various stages and places, but some some sort of coordinated action is is necessary for us to be able to undertake the kind of to 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 achieve the sort of outcome that that Stephanie mentioned in 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 South America particularly, and that's a that's a that's a pretty good model. Uh, I think for 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 how to do it, and the and the way to do that for me is to is to have more consensus driven standards about things. Um, so to promote discoverability, uh, and that discoverability should not only be it's not to be, to promote discoverability necessarily in in the north, but it's to pr promote discoverability worldwide, so that everyone could could discover it, you know, um, uh, and including ourselves. Um, so that was just just my thing. So one thing about standards and another thing about coordinating that that action in there. Um, so I, I, your question, yeah, I, I I think what we found really useful, I think I've already mentioned, um, is just the just the efficiency. Uh, we we like working in a way that that requires as little effort as possible. I'm quite a lazy human being, so if I can do less and then it turns out better, that's that's the way to go with it. Um, but to, to to have the accuracy of those uh, of those inputs, uh, I think the level of support that we get uh, is really really great. Um, and I know that we 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 probably seem a little advanced compared to 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 some other publishers, but the, but it's a, it's a few short steps really uh, to get to that point. So yeah, very very happy working with Science Open. I think they feed into our mission driven um, ethos um, about producing high quality work with the broadest possible discoverability. Uh, and we're constantly looking to the to the future. You know, there's 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 discussions about well, how can we make this better? This is great, well done. What's next? You know, a little pat in the back and a beer, and then off we must go again. Uh, so so I, we we quite enjoy working with that, uh, partnering with organisations that that share that share that um, sensibility. Mm, mm, mm. Thank you so much. And uh, are there before I open it up to the uh, to the participants? Are, are there any other digital service? A digital services that complement your work, you know, to make it more seamless and efficient that you'd like to make mention of? Sure. I mean, we, you know, um, we we work with um, Crossref ourselves for our books. And as I said, we were, we're looking to use uh, Science Open Services uh, to, to, to enhance that, uh, to enhance that 
the the, the discoverability of it. But I, I did want to say something about the the metadata for books uh, project again, just just to come back to that. Uh, so I chair the um, South African National Metadata Users Group. It's a bit of a mouthful, but it's basically uh, working with publishers, retailers, um, distributors, warehouses, and libraries and the National Library of South Africa as well to ensure the rollout of a standardized metadata. Uh, and the idea is the idea of that behind that is really to 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 make sure that all books published in South Africa have shared metadata standards so that they can be discovered not just on Amazon and not just on the large um, uh, library suppliers, but also within our own national library catalog by our own booksellers. We're working on on creating metadata for these in not only in English, uh, but to have um, because we have eleven language official languages in South Africa, so to have it driven by vernacular language usage. Um, and what we think we're doing with this is a firstly creating an accurate record of what books are being published um, by a range of things, not only scholarly not only scholarly books, poetry and kids books, and that kind of thing but also beginning to open up markets for discoverability. So obviously some people are going to see this as a commercial interest. You could open up a bookshop that sells uh, books in a particular language only for children, and that could possibly become a, a business model for you. But really it's about the availability and the discoverability of, uh, of those. So working with organizations such as Editor, who, who work very closely with the, um, with the, with the Onyx standards, uh, working on new subject codes uh, through organizations like FEMA, uh, and tying these two things together, um, one of the examples that Stephanie used was a was a book about the termination of pregnancy services in Johannesburg during during the COVID uh, pandemic, and that 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 piece was written by uh, medical practitioners, medical researchers, but also um, uh, medical sociologists. So a real kind of cross section of things there. That's 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 medical research. That's someone who actually works in a in a clinic in a in a in a medical service offering, and then someone who's analyzing how all of this works and affects policy. So there's I think these touch points really are 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 of interest to us, and and that's I think where we begin to focus ourselves. So we 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 make sure we've got the research angle on it. Uh, but we also make sure that we we vest ourselves in in things like the supply chain so that people can uh, access the books through any number of points. We're not only publishing for for researchers. We're publishing for journalists and activists and regular people like ourselves um, as well. So a whole range of things. I haven't mentioned anyone specifically, but but yes, is the simple answer. I could have just done that. Mm. <laughs> But no, that, that was very, very insightful. And, and thank you for that uh, comprehensive answer, actually. Um, that was a lot of content. I'm pretty sure that we have so many questions to tackle uh, from the participants. Uh, let me just start by one from uh, uh, Dean Caton in the chat. Could tools like this be integrated to explore funding for African researchers? Um, uh, Dean, I'm sure you can offer a, a little bit more context on that. Uh, if you can just unmute and, and and go ahead with your question. Yeah, sure. I was just curious um, because I, I once worked on a system. Uh, it kind of got outdated because grid went down. And I was just wondering, um, yeah, maybe something similar can be done with raw. We, we, we only really uh, manually entered the, uh, the actual opportunities. And then we linked it to to grid, but is there any other kind of tools out there that um, funding institutions can actually uh, show what kind of grants that they have make those open? Um, there's there definitely um, there is. So we work with the with the, um, I think it's called the funder registry at Crossref. So we've built that into our into our metadata um, uh, submission um, platform so people can um, use a controlled vocabulary to look up this is the funder and then add their grant number and then add that in a searchable you know um, uh, field because right now what usually happens is the 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 funder is mentioned in the acknowledgments so there's an acknowledgement section you know like roughly this is where you would potentially find funder information but you know why not just say 
fund it? Why not have like a, a field like funder for this, right? Um, and more and more. So I know that Crossref has also a program to get funders to register and give DOIs for the for for the grant proposals and for the for the grants so that there is then as well a way to track um uh the 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 information because i think what we will i i i do think it won't be fast um but andrew mentioned like oh maybe we you know things might change and we won't we might not be working with pdfs you know in 10 years um and i do see that you hear a lot of talk about how the article could um, end up dissolving into a sort of a backbone of events and pieces um, that are kind of held together with like, this is a related to this um, relationship. So you've got your core paper, but you've got like, this is a data set of this paper. You have, this is the preprint of the paper. This is the peer review of the paper. This paper was uh, funded by this grant. This grant can have this um, DOI that says uh, this papers are related to this grant. So I, I, I think, I hope that we'll see in the future more of these kind of event data that puts um, DOIs in relationship to each other. And then you would be able to, you know, just um, query Crossref for that. As a metadata affiliate, you could just say, uh, I want this, you know, show me all of the data that you have for this um, uh, funder ID. And then you would be able to pull down that um, pull down that information. And re uh, regarding the grid, so the grid database has been pretty much um, directly subsumed into the into the ROAR database. Um, so I think you can probably still um, set up those kind of um, links as well. So uh, I haven't tried that, but I would I would at least poke around on the ROAR page and see what you could find out about their APIs. Thanks, it's definitely, I, 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 Harold, I would just add um, also just the, the RAID project uh, that Stephanie mentioned, which is a credit project for, for research initiatives. Uh, and those may be published, in which case they would be a, a DOI and all of this stuff. Well, they're, they're DOIs for data sets through data sites, I guess. Um, but they're different ways of, of ensuring credit for the institution using raw, but for the individual using RAID and the, the project using RAID um, rather. So I think there are multiple multiple things you could do here with the publication, the data set and the project uh, tied to the institution, I guess. Mm, mm, mm. Um, I, be, I believe that answers uh, uh, your question. Please feel free to ask any question in the chat or you can just raise your hand and you can be given some time to, to say something. When when there are no questions, it means that the, the presentation was very, very your own point and it was good, you know. Um, okay, we seem not to be having any any further questions. Joe, would you like to come in and say something? Um well, yes, thanks so much for uh, for the three of you, or to the three of you, and particularly Stephanie and Andrew. Um, yeah, and um, we have a few other sessions coming up, so you can check out our webinar um, session overview link that we've shared earlier. Um, and the whole point with the series of webinars is to showcase what's available to African scholars, African scholarly stakeholders to tap into the digital services that we have that are um, with heart and passion and sweat and tears in some instances also delivered to you by people like Stephanie and also Andrew um, working at the intersection as a service provider and user um, to, this, to, to the well, South African or which university in, in your case, Andrew but also the wider community to engage and to allow us to really build a globally inclusive scholarly community to allow research um, accomplishments to trespass any boundaries that we currently still experience, but that's shrinking thanks to services like Science Open. Len, would you like to 
to say something? Um, no, I, I think that the presentations were great, uh, and I'm glad I attended. Thank you for the invite. Yeah, and also maybe for context, you you have been working with Tenet for many years, which is uh, yes. like Ubuntu, mm -hmm. but a national um, infrastructure that's, provider. That's so. Yeah. yeah, so I'm retired now, but um, but I'm still doing some uh, casual work for them. Mm -hmm. So, or maybe on that note. Um, from the top of your head, what what's your what's your takeaway from this session, and also how you saw things evolve on, over the the time that you were working with Tenet? Like, are you hopeful? Are you excited about what's what's next? Yeah, I think, like, I think it, there is certainly uh, at at the, at the Tenet's level a lot of interesting things going on. Um, it's not an area that we've apart from the orchid side of things. It's not an area that we've spent a lot of time. On, for instance, tenant doesn't have storage space and stuff like those kinds of things that would really be nice. Mm. Uh, so there's, there is an opportunity there. Great. And mm. as always, we're, we're here to learn with and from each other. So it's a Absolutely. knowledge flows in all directions. <laughs> Thank Absolutely. you, Stephanie. And over, back, back to you, Harry, to wrap it up. Thank you so much, Joe and uh, Elaine as well. Um. Thank you very much, everybody, for joining the, the webinar session. Um, as Joe has said, it is a series. Um, the recording for this session will be made available on the on the website on uh, africaarchive.org, which was shared in the chat. Uh, I think I'll share again at the end. Uh, you can get the full details to register for the ongoing webinar series, also at a link that I'll be putting in the chat uh, shortly. Our next session will be with Crossref. Uh, Johansen Obanda who will tell us about the research nexus and the African cross of ambassadors who share from their experiences. Um, as I said in the beginning, the webinar is co-organized by Ubuntu and Alliance and Access to Perspective as part of the Org ID uh, Global po Participation Program. Allow me to paste some links that you can follow in the chat. There we go. Uh, our speakers today were uh, Stephanie Dawson uh, from Science Open and Andrew Joseph from Wits University Press. Thank you so much, guys, for such uh, great uh, presentations and uh, for such great insights. I think on that note, we can uh, end the webinar and please make sure to attend the webinars, the, the next webinars that are coming in the series um, so that you can learn more and benefit in the best way possible. Thank you very much, everybody, for uh, attending. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye.